Welcome to an invitation to sisterhood. We want you to join us on a journey as we discuss everyday issues affecting our lives. Women in the Bible and of Christian history continue to have an impact on the world even years after their deaths. We can learn so much from them. They are sisters of inspiration and we're all sisters in Christ. Today we're talking about spreading the good news with Father Larry Richards founder and president of the Reason for Our Hope Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading the good news by educating others about Jesus Christ. Our saint of inspiration today is John the Baptist. I'm joined by my co-host, ECRC director, Patricia Buna, and Adora Ibrahim from the Benedicta Institute for Women. Spreading the good news. Do you guys feel like you do this every day? Wow, I sure, I sure hope I do. I try at least, yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, gosh, it's not as easy as we think. Hey, let me just get out the Bible and start yeah, reading it yeah. to you guys. Or yeah. hey, let me just tell you about confession. You know yeah. what I mean? Even like I work at ECRC, which has evangelization as one of the E's in there. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's tough. It's a tough yeah. one. It's intimidating. It's definitely yeah. part of it too. I think it's praying for that strength and the courage to do it, but... I remember talking to Father Alex Kress, my uh, spiritual director, years ago about this. And he started talking about evangelization. I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that looks like. Like, how am I supposed to do that? And he says, he said to me, don't ever start talking about the Catholic faith. And I looked at him like, he goes, because you'll, you'll lose people. Right. He goes, always start with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because the Catholic faith, and we start talking about why we go to confession. Yeah, and and, ca and yeah. You lose people. And he goes, but if you just start with Jesus. Yeah. And when I started reading about Father Larry Richards, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what Father Alex said, you yeah. know? And it makes so much sense. And after, you know, when you read about him and what he's doing about spreading the good news and coming from a place of just love and what Jesus is all about, you can, you can pull people in opposed to start talking about, well, you need to go to confession. They're going to go to hell. You have to go to church every Sunday. And, you know, just start talking about Jesus and, and how much he loves you and how much he wants yeah. you to be part of his life and you part of his life. Sure. It makes such a big difference. Because I think society today is very, like, anti-religion. Yeah. It's it's just like, and I think it's from generations of, of poor, I don't know. They, poor catechism. Mistrust. Yeah. People yeah. mistrust of religion, too. Well, like, you have true. to kind of admit that, too. And, and right? they think it's rules you know, and regulations. Rules and regulations. And check this off and For check sure. that off. And guess what? Now I have a gold star because right. I do all these things. Right. You know what I mean? I think there's, there's definitely self-righteous people right. in the in the church, right. in organized religion. So those are like, oh, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. That's right. like the huge thing everybody says now. I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. Right. I don't want to be stuck to the rules of organized religion and it's right. like so I think he, Father Alex is a point you don't want to start with that because there's this negative connotation right. with all of that instead start with Jesus and with love and when you start to look deeper into well what is this you know what is this Jesus everyone's talking about what is this love everyone's talking about or you're talking about Vanessa walks in the room or Dora walks in the room and I see this light she always talks about this Jesus person this Joan of Arc person and <laughs> they look into it yeah. and that's when they're going to be converted but if you start talking about the rules and regulations you hand them a catechism you well especially them. today with yeah. all the scandals we've had in the church I can't tell you how many people saying Oh, I, I have no trust in the Catholic Church. And I don't I, blame them. You don't. Yeah, you don't. can't. And I no. keep telling people, you guys, it's not the church; it's the people. Correct. And and you know, when you start with Jesus, you kind of take away the sins of the people yeah. when you start talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so you want to always start with Him because when you start talking about the church, people think of all the scandal that went on in the church, you know, and they're like, well, they're, you know, they're horrible people that run that church. Well, yeah, they're horrible people in the church and we have to pray for them. Yeah. But when you take them out of that, the church still remains as Jesus' you church. You know, this analogy just came to me and I might explain it wrong. So say it was in your own family, right? People that you grew up with, people that you knew, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, and some, someone in your network did something bad you would be more forgiving because you know them right. and you've known them. Yeah, right. But someone from the outside would be super critical of them because they don't know them. Because exactly. probably what's happening in society is they're not, they don't know these people. They don't know the, the burdens of a priest. The, I'm not justifying or excusing anything that, that's been done, no. but it's like we're kind of more forgiving because or understanding because we're, we're in it. It's well, like think family. about it as parents, you know? okay? Think about our children. Yeah, I was just do thinking the same Do you really think that your kids could ever do anything that you, you would say, I, c I can't love my child anymore? Impossible. Yeah, Impossible, Impossible yeah. okay? And it's the same thing with God the Father, the way that he loves us as his children. And I think a lot of times, you know, when people come from a place of condemnation, Nation, it's like, are you kidding me? When when were you ever perfect? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when you say start with Jesus, Jesus is love. 
Jesus mm -hmm. is love. And when you're a loving, kind, compassionate person, people mm -hmm. want to be with you. Mm -hmm. They want to be around you. They want to be loved by you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're a warm, caring, compassionate mother versus like a condemning, mean, punishing mother, who, who would, what child would want to come and sit in your lap for an hour? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. It, it really is, has to be the same way with the people that we encounter. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's, it is about an encounter. And they might not walk into the doors of a church, but guess what? We are the church out in the streets. Mm -hmm. And if we exude that love that Jesus has given us by going to the cross for us, mm -hmm. I mean, come on, you guys. You got to start that way. And you know, you can do something as simple when you talk about spreading the good news. Maybe you're not an articulate person. Maybe you don't know how to communicate, but invite them to something. Yeah. You know, invite them to hear a speaker. Invite them to mass one day. Yeah. You know, invite them to some event going on that somebody else is evangelizing. You're just, you evangelize by just bringing them there. Yeah. You know, to, to maybe it's praise and worship. You know, that's a way to spread the good news. It doesn't have to so much be come out of your mouth because some people are intimidated. Yeah. They feel like, they don't know how to do it. They don't or know how to articulate. Sometimes I've sent people links. Oh, watch this video and listen to yeah, this podcast. Yeah, I did that. Tell, I did that. You know, I'm like, let yeah. someone else tell them. Or how yeah. about just go for a cup of coffee? Or how about mm. just you know go to dinner? Sometimes you know people are starving for companionship, yeah, that's and true. you know it, it is you know being together on this journey. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Cook them an awesome meal. You know, mm -hmm. have a glass of wine together, or go mm -hmm. out to dinner, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes people don't even realize what they need until they encounter what it is that's been missing from their life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know a lot of people like to throw around evangelization and, oh, I have to have a PhD in theology. You really don't. My grandmother didn't have a single degree, but she probably evangelized Father. more people than anyone I know. Well, Father Solanus, blessed Father Solanus yes. Casey, wasn't considered smart enough to be a full priest. Right. You know, I mean, there's many people like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, St. Mother Teresa was on the streets of Calcutta. Right. You know what I mean? And, right. and evangelized by loving those who nobody wanted to love. And look and at the careful. light that, yeah. it, that comes mm -hmm. from Mother Teresa. Even looking back on her life and looking yeah. at the pictures, the whole world is enthralled with her because, mm -hmm. not because, you know, she held a title or because she was a nun, but because of the way she loved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about um, John the Baptist? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh my Talk goodness. About our saint yeah, our the saint. John the Baptist, today. every single thing that he did, in fact, when he heard, uh, when he encountered Jesus in the womb of the Blessed Mother, while he was in the womb of his very own mother, Elizabeth, it said the infant leapt in her womb. Mm -hmm. He was the first one to recognize Jesus Christ and guess what he did for the rest of his life until the day that he was executed. He pointed everyone to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about the apostle to the apostles, mm -hmm. right? And that's basically who we are. That's mm -hmm. basically who the Blessed Mother mm -hmm. is. You know, I know a lot of people have a problem with her, but she, we don't worship her. We go to her because every single thing she ever did from the moment of her yes pointed to her son, yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Even John the Baptist, when Jesus asked him to baptize him, he says, I'm not worthy. To you fasten know, to, your sandal, sandal strap. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. Wow. Like, uh -huh. neither am I. Who in the world are we? But yeah. we're the children of God. And it's because he loved us first mm -hmm. that we can go out and love, right? Despite our brokenness, despite all the things that, you know, happen within us. A lot of times, you know, we talk about anger. We talk about trauma. Anger is a secondary um, emotion. There's usually fear behind that. There's usually hurt behind mm -hmm. that. You know, if you just, like they say, if you walk a mile in someone's shoes, you mm -hmm. might understand where they're coming yeah. from. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. even the ones that like can't stand you for whatever reason. Sometimes I feel like whatever spirit is oppressing them, mm -hmm. you know, bumps up against the Holy Spirit and you're like, whoa, I, I didn't even say anything. Like yeah. what's going on over yeah. here? You know, so yeah. it's just yeah. you do you do wonder why certain people don't you know have an issue with you, and you're yeah. just like, what? Where is the disconnect? If I know I've never done anything to somebody, right. where is the disconnect? Where is right. that pain coming from? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, but but even sometimes you can flip it around and say, why do we sometimes have an issue with certain people? Yeah. Is there something yeah. that they're exuding that? that was reflecting on our own insecurities. Yes, our own, that's true. You know, short, we're falling short in some that's area too. That's, that's very true, yeah. Patrice. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just so we all, ha you know, start with Jesus. And that's what Father Larry's, uh, Richard's whole ministry, and we're going to talk to him about that coming up. But 
his whole ministry is really about spreading the good news, but doing it by educating people about Jesus Christ. And what a, if you take it down to, and I don't want to say take it down to the simplest terms of Jesus Christ, but if you just focus on Jesus, everything else comes into play. Then it's easier to talk about confession. Then it's easier to talk about our sacraments when you start with Jesus. Then people are open to say, okay, then why do you guys go to, you know, why do you have these sacraments? Why do you go to confession? Why, why, why do you really believe Jesus is in the body blood of, of, of the Eucharist? I mean, when you start with him, everything else falls into place. It yeah, and it's, it's like sowing seeds, you know? Yeah. It's like plant the seed, the Holy Spirit will grow the seed. Yeah. You know, we might not ever see it. I was going to say, you might yeah. not ever see the We fruit. might not, ever, not, mm -hmm. not see it. You know, maybe there's people we've been praying well, we for for 10 day. years. We will, God willing. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all aiming. Yeah, we're yeah, aiming we're for answer. heaven. So yeah. God willing, you know, yeah, we get we there together. Lots of questions to ask God when we get oh, there. Oh, yeah. Get out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, God willing. We got to invite Father Larry to join us. So stay with us, everyone. We'll come right back and talk with Father Larry Richards right after this. And welcome back to an invitation to sisterhood. Joining us now is Father Larry Richards, founder and president of the Reason for Our Hope Foundation. Father, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a joy to be here. <laughs> I'm with all these mean. women. Look yeah. at me. It's like I am blessed among women. Yeah. I have been invited to the sisterhood, so I'm quite excited. <laughs> See, all men were this gracious to be here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so I'm exactly. still not sure what's going on, but hey, here we yeah. go. <laughs> but our sisterhood needs brotherhood, right? You got that Amen. right. As long as you want me so. to be a woman. And that'd be bad. Yeah. No, no, no. Is that that? No, good? That's not this no, kind of a program, no, right? No. Yeah, but good. No, no. Come as you are. <laughs> so yeah, you know, Father, we're talking about you. You've been talking about spreading the good news and mm. starting with Jesus. And why is that so important that we start with Jesus when we talk about spreading the good news? Because he's the Alpha and the Omega, huh? Everything begins with Jesus. Everything ends with Jesus. As the second person of the Trinity. Uh, Jesus said in, in, in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm -hmm. And too often we try to do evangelization or we try to live Christianity or we try to be holy or we try all these things under our own power. And that, uh, that's why it doesn't work. And it just makes us hate ourselves more and different things because we try to do stuff without the source of all life. And the source mm -hmm. of all life is Jesus. And mm -hmm. so the point of evangelization is to preach Christ and the point of uh, being making disciples is to be a disciple. So it's so important that Jesus is my life. And the only way he is our life is our own reality is if we have daily committed time with the Lord. You know, and so like I can sit there and talk about, oh yeah, Jesus, we're starting with Jesus and end with Jesus. But if I'm not doing it in my own life, it's nothing. You know, yeah. so as a priest, like this morning, I woke up at 3.55 in the morning and mm -hmm. I do my holy hour from 4 to 5 because I'm so busy. You know, I have all these things. I have to come and drive to Detroit and be with uh, these great ladies here, <laughs> you know. And so, but if I sat there and said, oh, I can get my prayer in later or put Jesus in later, whenever we fit Jesus into our day, he's never first. And God, we can talk all we want till God is first in my life. If you're fitting God into your day, he's not. You have to build your day around God. And so normally that means that we begin with God in our own lives in the morning and we end our every night with the Lord. And the way I do that practically with people is I say, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. So we should have the Bible next to our... <laughs> I love uh, it, I love the it. The Bible should be next in our, you know, uh, what do you call it, a bed a stand. A nightstand. A nightstand. Night stand. And before you get out of bed, you pray the Holy Spirit and you say, Spirit of living God, speak to my heart your word. And you open up his word and you read it until God takes a two by four and whacks you over the head. You have begun your day with Jesus. And the problem is, huh, we all become negative and realists and we talk about all these negative things because we watch the news or we look at Twitter or we look at Facebook and it's all bad, trust me. Okay. But we're called to proclaim the good news. Right. So but if we don't start with the good news every day, Jesus, we start with the bad news and then we become bearers of bad news. And that's why instead of drawing people close to Jesus, people go away from Jesus because of us, because we have become the bad news. No matter how dark the darkness is. You ever notice if you light a candle, you light a match, it can never overcome the darkness. The light is always stronger. So Jesus is the light, but then he says, you are the light. And so that means we got to bring the light. And the only way we do that is if we start our day 
beginning in the good news of Jesus Christ. So we begin our day, and before we tell God what we want and how he's supposed to live our life and how he has to give me what he wa I want him to do and how he has to jump through my hoop, I stop, <laughs> I start the day, and I say, God, you so speak true. to me first. And then I listen until God says something, and then you can write it on a piece of paper, put it in there, and then you, you, God spoke to you before the world, the flesh, the devil, anything. Do the same thing before you go to bed. Now you've began your day with God, you ended your day. You begin with good news, you end with good news. Then we become hope in a world that doesn't know hope. You know, Father Larry, that's not an aha moment. That's like a duh. <laughs> yeah, a duh, exactly. Yeah. That is a duh. duh. Exactly. <laughs> when you were talking, I was like, wow, why did it take me 50 years to figure that one out? Yeah. Thanks for letting me know yeah. that, Father Larry. <laughs> It's a, I mean, that's just, it's all about Jesus. And yeah. so it must really be in our is. daily life. Absolutely. Yeah, well, my kids were little, even till this day, actually, before they, you know, left my presence, I would tell them, I love you, you know, mm -hmm. kiss them. Good. And then I'd say, be the light. Exactly. And they knew what that yeah. meant. Sure. You know, and now when my kids write me my cards, you know, Mother's Day or, you know, birthday or whatever, you know, and they started to sign it, be the light. We oh, love you. Bless and God. I was like, yes, bless thank God. you, Jesus. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Father Larry, what inspired you? I know we started with Jesus, but really what inspired you to, to this ministry, this, this foundation? Well, you know, I came to Christ when I was 17. And because uh, I really, I had a moment when I was in public high school that I realized I was going to die someday. We're reading the play Our Town. And if you ever read the play, the main character, she dies. And it was the first time I realized, 17, I'm going to die someday. And I didn't believe in anything. And I just thought... I shouldn't believe in something just because I was brought up that way. That doesn't make it true. I could have been a uh, Jewish, Protestant, atheist, Muslim. I could have been brought up. So just because you're brought up something doesn't make it true. So I thought, I want to find out what's true. And so I'd go to the Church of Epiphany in downtown Pittsburgh because God's a Steeler fan and that's where I'm from. And then I would sit there and uh, every day I'd say, God, are you real? Aren't you real? Don't you, uh, do you care? Don't you care? And one day I was watching Billy Graham, of all things, you know, uh, the Protestant minister. And he's sitting there and saying, I've seen people people die. And I'm thinking, you know, 17 year old kid, click, turn him right off. And oh, but I, was just, I was having problems with death. Let's go back. Click. And he said, like, again, I've seen people die. Sometimes when people are dying, they're afraid. I don't want to die. I'm afraid. And other people, when they're dying, they're saying, Jesus, I'm coming home. And I thought if I could face death with no fear, that would be the greatest gift. And so once I came to know that Jesus was real at the Church of the Epiphany, then I always, from the very beginning, when I wrote, I entered seminary at 17, I wrote the letter to the vocation director. It says, I want to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. So when I got, pre, I got ordained a priest and then I, we started this foundation, it was again, the purpose of the Reason for Our Hope Foundation is to bring conversion, everyone to Christ in the world. Why? Because it's God's will. When you ever sit there and say, I want God's will in my life, what's God's will? Well, God tells us it's God's will. God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of his truth. That's all people. The people that agree with us, the people that hate us, the people that are atheists, the people are whatever it is. God wants them saved. He wants them in heaven. Do I want them in heaven? And like once my mother looked at me once and she said, well, Larry, if that person's in heaven, I don't want to be there. I said... <laughs> Don't worry, hey, Mom. Mom, you won't. <laughs> 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 to my own mother. Can you imagine? Because why? Because somewhere that we got to know that if it's God's will, that he wants, the, the reason he created everybody was to go to heaven, correct? Yeah. That's the reason. I know who made, made me, God made me. Why did God make me? To know him, love him, and serve him. That's not just for me. That's for all atheists, the whole, everyone in the world. So I got to have the heart of God that wants everyone to be saved. And I got to do everything in my power to do that. That's why we started the foundation, to put out uh, books and CDs and you know daily mass homilies and stuff on Twitter every day and uh, uh, Facebook and everything. And it's always the good news. Now at night, it's a gentle good news. In the morning, it's a kick in the butt good news. But it's always the good news mm -hmm. of Christ and wanting us to all grow in holiness, wanting all people to be saved. And so it's just when I, the more I have prayed, the more I know, okay, this is what God wants. He wants everyone he created to be with him forever. Now he gives us free will. Mm -hmm. So we can choose not to be with him and we can go to hell and most people I believe do that but I got to do everything in my power to get as many people home as possible. 
And so mm -hmm. when you see a transformation in people's lives, when it moves from their head to their mm -hmm. heart, like you said, you wanted to, you know, find out for yourself. Sure. Um, how do you see their lives uh, transform and then those around them? Well, again, I think that what transforms anyone's life huh, is the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, and so when we read about the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, that we start living our life with these fruits. That's the way you can tell. And it's interesting that all the fruits are always other-centered. Mm -hmm. You know, so when a person starts being not self-centered, but other-centered, like this past week, we had, well, I don't know when this will be shown, but we had the, the, the Gospel of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, what changed him was the love of Jesus. He was going to have, you know, table fellowship with what everybody knew was a great sinner. Why? Because he wanted him to be saved and come to the knowledge of his truth. He says, Zacchaeus, come down here. I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. <gasps> You're going to go to a sinner's house. Yeah. And then as soon as the guy, he stood his ground, he says, what did he do? I will give half of what I own away. Mm -hmm. And then if I've defrauded anybody, I will repay them four times. And then Jesus said, salvation has come to his house. Yeah. Because now he's no longer self-centered. Again, like I tell people all the time, if the only reason you follow Jesus is because you don't want to go to hell, right. well, who do you love? Right. Yourself. It's an act of selfishness, that that's not why we come to Christ. We come to Christ, so, and then when we look at the crucifix, there's a little one there. Anyway, when we look at a crucifix, pretend there's a big cross here. When we look at the crucifix, there's not one thing on that crucifix about Jesus. It's always about the Father and about us. So when we come to this conversion, when we've really converted, it's now about the Father's will, Jesus, the Spirit, and about other people. It's no longer about us. And when we are no longer about us, now we're entering into the kingdom the way we need to be. Because those who seek their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and the gospel will find it. So that's the key. That's the transformation. And I think that happens too when people realize that there's things that are holding them back oh, from sure. fully and freely giving their lives to Christ and I see transformation when people are healed too. You absolutely. talk a lot about, you know, trauma and wounds, you know, oh, when absolutely. people are growing up and a lot of times people don't realize that that's a way that um, the evil one kind of keeps you, you know, in a box, yeah. so to sure. speak. If you and, have a toothache, you're only yeah. concerned about yourself, exactly. yeah. you know, so if any kind of pain. So, you know, Jesus comes to heal us. Think about any time anyone was with Jesus. Not all the time, but a lot of times when people wake, went out of their way to be with them, he healed them. Mm -hmm. you know, and then when he healed them physically, then, or sometimes he healed them spiritually, and then the physical healing come. But I often talk about this very day, right now, Jesus Christ is in every Catholic church. The same Jesus that walked the face of the earth is in that tabernacle or in, like we have perpetual adoration, he's there 24 hours. And if we would just stop, go out of our way, and spend time with him, and then, like in my adoration chapel, it says, Psalm 46, verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Oh, so if you can go in there, go, and you go in there and you sit and you're still and you are God, you can do anything, healing can come mm -hmm. because you're now putting yourself in a place where God can do great things for you. And when you have the faith that you are my God and you are here, Whoa, you're touching the hem of the garment just for a yeah, second yeah. and bam, you can have yeah. great things happen. Absolutely. So, so when you're talking about being the light, I think it's a beautiful way for us to you know, start with scripture and, mm -hmm. and to be the light. But what are some practical ways like ECRC, we're here to evangelize. Good. People always think evangelizing is standing on the street corner with a rosary and that's super intimidating to most people or even if it's in your workplace or with your family, we've talked before about sure. You know, being around Christmas holidays sure, or whatever, the pagans the family. Are our family. Yeah, yes. and then you're like, I live with oh, them. <laughs> you, you do the prayer. You're the church one, right? Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you get that all the time too. Like, oh, Father, lead us in prayer. Yeah, you know, yeah, but, yeah. We've but never how prayed. can we be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How can what are some, what are some practical advice we can give to you? The way to I always do, the, the the way to evangelize this, and you have to keep it in order. The first thing you do is pray. 
because the only the Spirit of God can bring the people to conversion. Again, sometimes we're afraid. Well, I can't do it. Well, you're absolutely right. You can't do it. And your argument, and because you have your degree in theology, and you and you know all the apologetics of the church, you know how to win arguments. You ever notice that doesn't bring anyone to the church? It usually sends them farther away because now you'll get in a fight because you're wrong. Da, da, da. So the first thing you do is you pray for them. So I encourage people to have a list of people in your family, and you pray for them, especially before Thanksgiving and before Christmas. Probably like a notebook. Yeah, no, and you just not, sit there, but you go over them, because what happens is when you pray for someone, it's like the sun is out today, which doesn't happen much in Erie, PA, but the sun is out today, and if you take a magnifying glass and you put it over something, the rays of the sun are focused through that magnifying glass and sets things on fire. When you and I pray, we become spiritual magnifying glasses, and the grace of God, which is everywhere, goes through us and sets people on fire. So we pray for them, but if you really want it to go to the next level, you fast for them, because when you start fasting, I fast most days and I do it for people who hate me and there's a lot, not a lot of them, and people who don't like me and people who don't know Jesus or whatever and I fast and I just eat one meal and I say, Lord, I offer this up for them today. Then that grace is intensified. It's like shining and cleaning that magnifying glass and it'll set them on fire. So we start by prayer because we acknowledge that it's God, it's not us. The next thing we do is we love them. Now remember, Jesus said, all people will know you're my disciples, not because you know the faith, not because you're good, not because you're living a holy life. All people know you're my disciples because you love one another. And God is love. So the best way to bring people to God is we love them home. We don't judge anyone home. No one's going to come home from our judgment as much as we like to think about it. They don't. We love them home. So they got to think that we're the most loving person that they've ever met. Because that's who God is. And, you know, I just read uh, a great thing by uh, Pope Benedict XVI. He wrote a book on for priests. And he says, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to continue the incarnation in us. Mm. And I was like, what? Let me read that again. That seems like heresy to me. The work of the Holy Spirit is to continue the incarnation. The incarnation is when God, So he says, the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make all of us Jesus. Huh? You know, and I'm like, whoa. And I just sat in my adoration. I'm like, that's one of the most powerful things I think I've ever read. That so the purpose is, so I'm supposed to show people God. Jesus showed people God. And who is God? Love. He came to love us. It doesn't mean we're gentle all the time. Sometimes it means we kick people in the butt. But they got to think that we love them more than anybody else ever has because we're talking to them about the God of love. So we pray for them. Then we love them. And then we witness to them. So I call it pray, love, tell. Pray, love, tell. Usually we want to tell first, and that's why nobody listens to us. And we, then we say, well, they're going to hell anyway because they didn't listen to me. Because you didn't pray for them and you didn't love them. You're the one going to go to hell first because you didn't do what you're supposed to do, in my opinion. So finally, it goes to the tell thing. And the tell thing is, it's not just preaching the gospel. It's witnessing, because witnessing is much different. Witnessing is, this is what Jesus Christ has done for me. He set me free from my sins. He's healed me. He's loved me. And the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved. And when we share with them what Jesus Christ has done for us, that's a witness. We have proclaimed the gospel. And who of any of our friends, any of our family members, don't want to be loved? And no one will love them like Jesus loves them. Years ago, I was once at a, uh, I was a chaplain at a college. And the big thing at the college was the LGB, you know, the gay community and everything. And I'm hearing confessions and my kids are getting crucified out there. And they're saying, Father, we're getting killed outside. I said, because <laughs> they're trying to fight with them about why homosexuality is wrong and everything. I said, wait till I come out. So I come out. And they had the video, the cameras and that there. And, Father, can we interview you? Please. And so he says, the guy put his, the thing right in my face. Do you believe the homosexuals can go to heaven? Well, sure. <gasps> what? Do you believe it's a sin? Oh, sure. Just like sex before marriage is a sin. Missing mass on Sunday is a sin. Getting drunk on purpose. It's all moral sin. Any one of those things will send you to hell forever. I said, let me give you a hint here. The deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved. And people who are homosexual or whatever... They're trying to fill that emptiness inside. And the only one that's going to fill that emptiness is Jesus. Amen. And if you knew the love of Jesus, Amen. nobody else would be come close. And the guy says to the camera guy, would you turn off the camera? And he turned it off and he starts sobbing. And he said, Father, would you help me? Aww. And I said, of course I'll help you. Amen. And this man came to conversion when he wanted to come and show the world how wrong the church was and how wrong we were. Aww. He was not expecting to be loved. Mm -hmm. And when I loved him where he was and I shared with him the truth, 
he came to Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we just want to argue with people and say, don't you know how wrong you are? Because they do know it. They really do in their heart of hearts say, my command. Say, well, no, that's where the anger true. comes from. Exactly. Yeah. The anger comes from a place of knowing truth and exactly. living against it. Sure. It's like the people who have abortions. We're not judging them, but sure. the women who attack you usually are in pain. Mm -hmm. Great be pain. Because of what they've done. Because I know pain. whether whether you believe in God or not, it's against human nature to kill your child. Exactly. So that is where a lot of the pain comes Absolutely. from, right? And we got to preach truth on that. That yeah. this is what it is. We're killing human beings. And and so when a person does that, like again, but then we got to bring the healing. So like yeah. I do a lot. I, I probably hear more confessions than any other priest in the United States because every weekend that's all I do is go around and hear confessions and speak on confessions. And so I hear abortions a lot. And so I say to people, this is what you need to do. You need to ask. First, you need to repent of your sin. Then you ask God if he gave you a boy or girl. And then you have to reach into heaven and ask God and name your son or daughter. And then you reach into heaven and by name, you ask them for forgiveness. Wow. And then you'll be free. <laughs> you know, because most people, they just feel condemned. Yeah. But I say, where well, you put a period, God put a comma. That child sees the face of God. And that child has been praying for you, their mother or father, to come to conversion because they want you with them. And so you got to ask God who he gave you, boy or girl. Name them because they deserve a name. You're their mother. They're their father. Name them. And then reach into heaven and ask them for forgiveness. Because they are truly the holy innocents of today, right? Sure. You know, and so they are alive and see the face of God. And so when we can bring not only the truth of you have killed a human being, but the way to bring healing and reconciliation with that child, and then what happens is they come to great conversion, and then they become usually so pro-life, it's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, and again, that's what we want. Like we want, you know, like when we start seeing people in sin or doing all these things, all these, you know, people, they are uh, prisoners of war, and yeah. the devil has them. Literally. And if, exactly, and if we, we don't get mad at prisoners of war, no. we do everything to free set them us. free, exactly. So we have to always look at ways, how do we, proclaim the good news without ever, you know, becoming la la and it says it doesn't matter what you did. That's the worst thing you could ever do. It says it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. That's why Jesus went to the cross. But he also brings the redemption to sin, which is himself and his love. When he went to the cross, he took all of our sins and I have a plenty of them and he paid the penalty for me and whoa, he set me free and that's what he wants to do for you. You know, Father, you um also wrote a book, Be a Man, Becoming a Man, God Created You to mm -hmm. Be. Can you speak to us a little bit about that as talking to our husbands, our brothers, our sure. dads? Uh, or uh, I, I based it, be, be a Man comes from uh, 2 Kings 2, where it's the last words that King David said to his son Solomon. And it says, take courage and be a man. And David is the one held up as the example of manhood. And David was a horrendous human being. <laughs> he was a murderer. He was a rapist. Someone says, where was he a rapist? Bathsheba. That was a rape thing. You know, and he was all these things. And yet God looked at him and said, here is a man after my own heart. So I've often thought, you know, as a man, I have, you know, someone once read, once read my book and they wrote me an email and they says, Father, you have issues. And I says... <laughs> I have more issues than you could ever imagine. But a man with issues, David had issues, and God still looked at him and said, not only even in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament with St. Paul, here is a man after my own heart. And one thing about David, with all his weakness, he always wanted to do the will of God, even after he, that's why he repented whenever he did anything wrong. But he also lived a life for others. And see, sometimes people think when I talk about being man, it's like a machoism. It's the exact opposite. Being of the perfect man is Jesus Christ on the cross. So if you want to be a man, you got to go to the cross. So your job as a man is to give up your life for your wife and for your kids. So again, so like the whole thing, some guys are like, my wife and kids will obey me. They're to be submissive to me. I said, get out of the faith. What's the matter with you? Your job is to serve them and give your life for them. That's subservient leadership. That's the leadership of Christ. Servant leadership. Yeah, exactly. And so yep. that's so the whole book is that. And out of the ten chapters, four chapters is how to live in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit teaches us how to be men or teaches us how to be women. People say, Father, why don't you write a book on being a woman? Because I know nothing about that. But it would have to do also, though, at least four chapters, I would think the Holy Spirit. Because 
the spirit of the God of the universe is the one who creates us and makes us so fully who we are. Amen. So that's what the spirit of God comes. He comes to reveal to us who we are in, in, uh, as a man or as a woman. And so the whole purpose of the thing, to break everything down, the whole book is, like I say, it's from St. John Vianney. Uh, it's the glorious duty of man that you pray and that you love. And so the whole book is teaching peop, men how to pray and how to not make excuses because my wife's the spiritual one. I will knock you silly when you say your wife's the spiritual one. You're supposed to be the spiritual leader of the house, so stop it. You're going to go to hell if you don't become the spiritual leader of the house and let the, my wife does all that stuff. That's the problem with the church. You know, I don't know. And again, this is controversial, but I've said it for a long time. Like the last 50 years, a lot of the men, a lot of the priests became more feminine and a lot of the nuns became more masculine. Yeah. We forgot who we were and we started to change the way things are. Now, uh, it isn't a thing for machoism. Men are called to be men. Women are called to be women. And then we come together and we complement one another. Mm -hmm. So when a man isn't a man and he's sitting there saying, oh, I don't know, I don't really pray, whatever. That's not who you were created to be. You were created by God to be the spiritual leader, to protect your family. And again, even again, when people blame poor Eve on everything that happened in Adam and Eve, I always blame Adam. I says, excuse me. Why wasn't if, he protecting Exactly. Her? He was right there. And he should have went <laughs> before the world, before the, before, the, before the devil, and said, you got to go through me mm -hmm. to get to my, my, my wife. And I say that to men all the time. I say, if you're not a man of prayer, the world, the flesh, you know, because I always say, gentlemen, if someone's going to break in your house tonight and kill your wife and kids, would you take a bullet to stop them? And they'll all go, yes, Father! Like, Great. Well, the world, the flesh, and the devil is going after your wife and kids every day. And if you're not a man of prayer, you leave them unprotected. And that's much worse because that's eternal. I said, your job as a man is to get your wife and kids to heaven. So in, you prayer, in your prayer every day, you look at the world, the flesh, and the devil, and you stand there with God. Because when we pray, we pray with Jesus because Jesus constantly intercedes for us. It says in Hebrews, again in Romans, he's interceding for us. So when a man prays, he's interceding with Jesus for his wife and his family. And he has to look at the world, the flesh, and the devil and say, you got to go through me to get to my wife or kids. And when a man doesn't do that, not only does he fall, but his family falls and the country falls. Mm -hmm. That's why we are as a country today. Like I, if men would stand up and stand against abortion the way they should in compassion and strength, there'd be no abortions in America. But we just sit there and all men can't cave. I can't say anything to this because it's a, it's a woman's right. And that, uh, you're sticking up for that child. Can we just sit there for a moment and say, will someone be man enough to stick up for that defenseless baby? Do we have no men left? You know? And so, so the call is to authentic masculinity, to authentic strength, but a strength of love, a strength of prayer, a strength of giving my life for other people. You know, that reminds me of when people call Jesus meek. Sometimes sure. they want to associate that with being weak, which is the complete opposite. Absolutely. It's basically being able to control your strength. And it is also, it's so much easier to criticize. I mean, right. We criticize all the time, and that's our first pattern. That's the way we do. It's so much e It's so much harder to be loving, so much harder to be affirming, so much harder in the midst of that. That's why, again, I think that even in the church today, we're all fighting each other. And God isn't calling us to fight each other. That's from the devil himself. He's calling us to unite and go against the evil in the world. But if he can keep us fighting amongst ourselves, he's just sitting back and laughing because we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves. The devil's doing all he wants. They're killing babies every day and everything else because we're fighting amongst ourselves. We need to unite in strength and then stand together about this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Yeah, and I think it all comes from love. Because, Absolutely. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, we're not only fighting amongst ourselves, we're fighting our very identities. Sure. You know? Absolutely. Every day. Every day. Father, how can we as women, as, as um, wives and daughters and sisters, whatever, help the men in our lives build a better relationship with Christ? Is you first of all pray for them. Second of all, and, I'm, and, I'm not, and prayer is the most important thing. But second is you can't, and again, often people sit there and say, I found my husband, he's looking at pornography, or he's doing this, and I told him not to die. He says, that ain't going to work. It's going to make him go stronger into himself. You need to pray for him to find the God to spend, uh, send a man in his life that will mentor him. Because when a man sees another man who loves Jesus, mm -hmm. 
then he'll become like that man. The problem is very few men have men that are strong, that can mentor others. But again, I just, you know, again, you, the, the, the most important thing you can do for your husbands is pray for them and ask God to bring a man into their life that will lead them to Jesus. And then maybe that's something that us, because all of us, not to brag, but sure. we have holy men and men that are, I think, very intentional sure. disciples. Maybe we challenge our husbands to go out and be those mentors exactly. to others. Because that's I'm not the saying point. my husband doesn't need a mentor, I'm yeah. sure he does. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Maybe he's, he's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you know? but maybe he married also, you, come on. Yeah. He has good I taste, mean, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but maybe we challenge them also to be mentors to other men in their lives. Absolutely, too. and that's why uh, men's movement, the, I think the number one thing in the church right now is the men's movement because for so long the devil has kept us apart yeah. and now the spirit is bringing us together and I really believe because something's going to be happening soon, it's going to come against us all and we got to stay strong, we got to come together and not be afraid of any of this stuff. You know, again, we are people of hope. If the world ends today, thank you God, we're all going to heaven. Mm -hmm. So there is this un... Like, I know that God wins. We know the end of the book. We know how all this goes. Sometimes we come off like, everything's a mess. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> God's still in control. No matter who the president, no matter who the pope, no matter who anything is, God's in control. Right. Now, and we got to keep preaching that. and Because that's part of the good news. That no matter what, God makes all things work together for good. Comment to those who love him, and no, no, uh, 828, yeah. to those who love him and called by his decrees, he doesn't make it do for everybody. But we who are seeking his will and praying for the, he's going to use us to make his will happen. Nothing. Think about it. One of the, I always go back to, think of the church in Rome. They wanted all of the Christians dead, and they were killing us. And there were thousands of us killing us one after another. Rome doesn't exist anymore. The church they try to destroy sits on top of that. Mm -hmm. The church will always win. We will always endure, no matter how dark it is, no matter what they're going crazy over. Excuse me, it's God's church. This is Jesus Christ. You know that uh, uh, Joan of Arc says, the church in Jesus Christ, there is no difference. Joan of Arc comes up every yeah. episode. There you go, around. there you go, there you go. There is no difference. The church is Jesus. We already have won as long as we stay in the church of Christ. You know, sometimes you spread the good news, going back to um, Patrice's point, is just inviting men to a men's conference with sure. you. Sure, oh my. Just inviting them. Yeah. I mean, you don't even have to say a word. Just come with me. Buy him a ticket. Get him a you ticket. Know? Yeah. You know, we were talking about that yesterday. I was talking to... Um, to somebody about, oh yeah, this girl, a hairstylist, whatever it was. She's like, oh yeah, I go to this Protestant church. So she grew up Catholic. Sure, sure. And then the priest left and then his other priests sub in and I didn't really connect with any of them. So I'm going to a different church. He's like, well, is it a Catholic church? She goes, I don't know busy or whatever her, the other, yeah, her yeah, friend. Yeah. What church is it? Oh yeah, it's it's a Protestant church. And I was like, how poorly was she catechized? Well, she course. didn't even know that the church she grew up in versus this Protestant church wasn't even a Catholic church. And I said, but you know what? That's what we don't do as Catholics. We don't invite people to our church. She oh, we went do there because church. she was invited. Exactly. Yeah. We don't invite people. We're like, yeah. oh yeah, it's my thing. It's we my church. We got to evangelize. And again, like what I do more and ever now is I do a lot of priest retreats. I just did one a couple weeks ago and I do a lot of that because the priests have to be excited about yeah. Jesus oh, yeah. and have to be proclaiming the gospel because oh, yeah. like it or not, if the priests and the bishops are not the ones proclaiming it, we are a hierarchical church. You know, some people are saying, well, we're going to take over. Well, they call that Protestantism. Yeah. You know? But the Catholic Church yeah. is a hierarchical church. So yeah. instead of just complaining about our priests and bishops, we got to pray for them because yeah. God wants, he has given them the power to be his presence in the world. Without a priest, there is no Eucharist. There is no forgiveness of sins. Yeah. It's just that simple. So complaining just makes them stronger in what they're doing. But if we fast and pray for them and help the Lord use them, the ones you created, because that's why when I, when I and you can watch it, I'm preaching to priests, that they're like, well, I know this. Why haven't I been living this? Yeah. You know, and so it's like, yes, you know, and so and it, it, it reaffirms to me that I got to make sure that I'm living what I'm proclaiming. It and goes back to that yeah. dumb moment. That yeah. dumb moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think even we talk about going on marriage retreats all the time. Yeah. I think sure. as priests, you guys do go on retreat too. Things that you learned, you know, for early on in your marriage, early on in seminary, you kind of need to be refreshed and reminded yeah. all the and, time. And we forget about praying 
you know, yeah. for the priest. We think of the men in our lives, and we sometimes forget the priest sure. in our life. Yeah. We, we got like about a minute or so left okay. with you, Father Larry. And uh, lucky Larry. you. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. We just want to ask any last words of, uh, of wisdom or advice for people watching today. Or Again, I just think the biggest thing is to fall in love with Jesus and uh, spend more and more time with Jesus. Praying is more important than breathing. It just is. And when we know that praying is more important than breathing, then we know that that's the most important thing I do every day, period. Nothing else is more important than prayer. It doesn't have to be hours, and it doesn't have to be just, you know, Santa rosaries and that. Of course, I carry a rosary first thing I do every morning, Divine Mercy Chaplet. But you've got to listen, because most people have never experienced being loved by God. And, you know, Jesus began his whole ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Every time you and I go before God, every time, God always says, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and I'm pleased with you. Even in our sin, think about it. God knew every sin you were going to do before he created you, but he still created you. That he's pleased with you, and when he's pleased with you because you're coming into his presence, he converts you. And he deals with the sin in your life. And he gives you the grace to stop sinning. Because most sin is trying to fill the emptiness. But when we let him fill the emptiness with himself, he pushes out the sin. Because sin is f fake love, who is God, is real. So the more we pray, the less we sin. The more we surrender, the less room in our life is for sin. Because God becomes more and we become less. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> thank I just you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have to go back and watch this. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Father Larry, for thank being you. with us. Thank Good you. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. Yeah, so it was Blessed thing. among women. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Stay with us, everyone. We're going to continue our conversation right here on an Invitation to Sisterhood. Welcome back to an invitation to sisterhood. What a lively conversation. Amazing. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how fast that went. I wanted to talk to him forever. When you said that's enough, I'm like, no, no, we just got started. <laughs> that was great. I know, and we actually went great. over time. He, I could listen to him forever, yeah. and I envy like people. I got to go see him at a conference. I got, I got to yeah, go. Yeah, you're going to sneak in. <laughs> yeah, it's a men's conference. But, you know, he, what, I mean, there's so many things that, like, I really do mean it. It's not just the aha moments. It was duh moments to me. Yes. It's like, like, hello, you yes, know, we sure. should know that. Yeah. And, and I love the, you know, you know, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. I mean, how simple, but true. See, one of the things that, that really resonated with me is that, is that hopefulness that, you know, if we all die today, great God, we'll go to heaven. Like, yeah. Because I feel mm -hmm. like we do, we can live in this doomsday, you know, type yeah. of mentality. And you see all the crazy stuff going on in the world. I'm reading this really great Catholic book now, but it's very heavy and it can be very depressing. For sure. But when you, you know that like his foundation is called the reason for our hope. I mean, mm -hmm. it's to be ho a hopeful people. Mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. I mean, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the joy that we get from the Lord where despite what's going on around mm -hmm. us, like we said, the whole world could, you know, be on fire and we're still going to have that deep, abiding hope, love, peace, and joy that comes from Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, the duh moments, yeah. you know, like being the light, you know, reading our Bibles. And I think for us in this busy day and age and commuting here and there and driving the kid to this practice or this thing, what's amazing is that there's so many apps now that actually have the Bible where you can just click, okay, I want to listen to Ephesians 6, 12, or I want to listen to Romans 8, 28, and you just hit play. You know, it's yeah. it's easier than ever, but it's also more distracting than ever. Yeah, but I loved his pray, love, tell yes. concept. Yes. And, you know, that whole philosophy of pray, love, tell, because it's so simple, but so true. You have to pray first, and then you have to come from a place of love. That conversion story he talked about with the reporter, yeah. you know, who thought he was going to be combative, but came from a place of love, and then asked the camera guy to turn off his camera so he could start, you know, he started crying. I mean, I've, I've had that experience one time before I worked in retail and this gentleman I worked with was homosexual and he's like, well, yeah, well, Jesus, there's no place for me in your church. And I was like, don't think that. I'm like, Jesus loves you. And he looked at me like I had spoken this like crazy thing. He's like, I'm like, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. He loves you. He doesn't not love you because you're gay. I'm like, you could, you know, and I, you know, encouraged him, but mm -hmm. it takes a lot of courage to do that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way he spoke, but if you just have that the theme of love so that I was loving him and that I was telling him how Jesus also loves him 
his heart is way more open. Sure. So. Think about our children. We're all parents, right? I mean, when we are, you know, domineering or commanding them to do something, you know, nine times out of ten, they're like, whatever. Right. You know, I'm not listening to her. But when you're telling your child in, you know, a tone, I'm not saying you, you never have, you know, a stern tone, but when you're coming from a place of love, your children know. Your mm -hmm. children know. And so, obviously, God is love, right? Yeah. And once we realize, oh, my gosh, God is coming from a place of love. He loves me. He mm. loves me. Despite of who I am, broken and sinful, <sighs> he loves me. He died for me. Whoa. And the message that he said so many people don't realize that they're loved. And they want love. And they don't know God loves them. And that's why we, we were created for it. Yeah, and we can't come from a place of um, uh, judge, judgment, and, yeah. and it, which is so easy for all of us to oh, do. It's right. so easy for us to judge right. somebody else's behavior without even knowing their journey. Right. And instead of saying, you know, no, Jesus does love you, yeah. you could have easily said, well, yeah, you're going to hell because mm -hmm. that's a sin. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean that, and I'm sure people have said that right. to others. So, um, and that's what we have to be reminded of, that we have to come from that place of love if you really want to tell people about Jesus. Because you start fighting, you're right. People just fight back. Yes. Yeah. You it's know? human you never, nature. You never, no one's ever converted through an argument. No, 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 absolutely not. And in fact, when you see someone, you know, we, we talk about our grandparents, your father. We talk mm -hmm. about, you know, all these hol holy men and women that have gone before us because, you know, we've never really seen any saints in our lifetime mm -hmm. except for John Paul II, right, on TV and yeah. for those who have met him in person. Mm -hmm. But there is literally a light. My grandmother had a light, okay? Mm -hmm. And when she walked into a room, it lit up. And you know what? She never had to say a word. And you know what? How beautiful would that day be where we could all literally walk in a room and light it up because we love God with all of our hearts and we want to serve him and we want to serve others that way. I mean, that is the basis of who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. And I think the reason for that with your grandmother, it's kind of what Father Larry was talking about with she was other focused. Completely. I think it's so easy for us to say, well, I want to go to heaven because I, this and me, me, yeah. me. And it's like, no, if you're there and you're there to serve your spouse and your kids and the rest of your family and all of those you encounter in your life, you're there to serve them and to bring them to heaven, then you're in, yeah. right? You know, and then that's what God wants. And that's when you're exuding that light. Absolutely. So we took so much from this show in that 35 minutes. It's unbelievable. Yeah. He was just so motivational. But we want to, as always, leave our viewers with something. So before we go, what are we gonna, we're going to share our pledges with you. I pledge to pray every day. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. I pledge to love everybody, especially those who hate me. I pledge to tell others about Jesus to truly spread the good news. I pledge to be a person of hope. I pledge to pray for the men in our lives and for them to find and be mentors.